Good afternoon. Can you guys hear me in the back? Okay, great. Um, so I'm Thomas. I'm an assistant professor from Howard University. Um, so welcome to DC, those that are visiting. Um, and today, um, I'd like to first thank the organizers of this inaugural event and for including my talk. And I'd also like to thank uh, the Historically Black College and University Minority Serving Institutions Program, where my research is funded. Um, my AFOSR program managers are Mr. Ed Lee and Harold Weinstock, and they've given me the opportunity to pursue this exciting research. Um, so let's get right into it. That was loud. Okay. So, uh, great. Um, so what's the big question that we're trying to address? Um, specifically, what we want to do is we want to ask ourselves, can we achieve a faster internet? Um, in today's society, um, we're constantly streaming, downloading, video messaging, and to reach this demand, what we want to do is we want to increase this internet speed. But if we go back, there's nothing about the internet in my title, right? except for maybe my email address. And more specifically, what does this achieving a faster internet have to do with, say, symmetry or some idea of symmetry? So we can take a look at um, the graph that's presented here, um, where you have your internet connectivity as a function in, in bits per second as a function of year. Um, and what we'd like to see is that uh, user's connection speed exponentially grows, so your left axis is actually an exponential, and it grows per year by something like 50%. Most of the students in my course this semester, 90s babies, they never got the opportunity to use a dial-up modem. Um, so when I was growing up, around their same age, I was on the same of the level of something like 100 kilobits or 100,000 bits per second, right? But today, due to current technology, and again, the higher demand, something like 5G internet, you may have heard of that, or something like um, fiber technology, that we have something on the order of thousands of megabits per second in today. Another thing, too, that we'd like to point out is that out of curiosity in making this talk, I went to Google. I said, exactly how much internet are, do I require in my household? And of course, there was an answer for that. That answer came from highspeedinternet.com. And it took me through a series of questions, like how many devices do I own? For that answer, it was way too many, right? Also, it said something like, on average per day, how many times do you watch Netflix? Or how many times do you FaceTime, right? And what it found, or the answer that it gave me, was that my minimum internet connectivity is at 35 megabits per second. And if we look at the chart and go back, just five years ago, I would have exceeded the maximum speed for my everyday use today. But luckily, because this trend doubles every year, your maximum available internet today is something like one gigabit per second, right? Very, very fast. But again, this is also increasing exponentially. So if we look at this curve, 10 years from now, we'll be at 100 gigabits per second. So how exactly can we achieve something that fast? And there's actually two approaches. Um, the first is that you can work with the technology that we have now. We can just make it more efficient, or we can increase that power. The second approach would be to go to a higher bandwidth, something like over 20 gigahertz. And that brings us into this regime of something called terahertz, right? So now we're getting closer to the, the actual title of my talk. Um, terahertz is 10 to the 12 hertz, or 1 trillion hertz, or 1,000 times larger than that of gigahertz. And a lot of research is currently being done by my group and other groups to start to reach this goal of hundreds of gigabits per second. And we hope that by using the second approach, our terahertz technology, that we'll, out, we'll be able to create these wireless networks. Another major portion of this is that there are a lot of technical, technological challenges of terahertz technology. Um, for instance, we need new modulation, amplification of this, 
And more importantly, we need to in integrate this new technology into the current technology that we have. Specifically, the AFOSR is funding my group to look at terahertz signal modulation. But again, we ask, can we achieve a faster internet? And the answer now is yes. But again, what does this have to do with this idea of symmetry? We can define symmetry as the invariance of an object to some type of change, right? And more importantly, what, you can, what we can find in society is that you can find symmetry in all aspects, music, nature, art, mathematics. It's beautifully presented by Leonardo da Vinci. He comes up again, right, back to back. In his um, famous portrait, our famous work, The Virtue in Man. And I'd like to point out here that this is actually a combination of art, geometry, and anatomy. It features a man centered at a square, right? Where the navel of the man is also the center of the circle that's seen. <clears throat> As he is in two positions, right? His legs are spread. When you spread his legs, that creates an equilateral triangle. The other thing that I'd like to point out is that his wingspan is actually the same height, uh, sorry, is actually the same length as his height. That's indicated by the square. Because of this proportionality and this um, symbol of symmetry, you can always find this when you're thinking about um, looking for examples in society of this idea of symmetry. But I'm a physicist. And one of my favorite physicists is Richard Feynman. In his series of lectures, one that's really interesting on YouTube is he's given this lecture at Cornell about symmetry. And specifically what he's doing is that he's looking at these symmetry operations with most of them having to do with invariance of time and space. Um, he then goes into great detail of more advanced topics of symmetry in atoms, quantum mechanical phase, and also in ma matter and antimatter. And at the end of this lecture, he actually starts to talk about the nearly symmetric world that we live in. And what happens physically are the consequences of breaking that symmetry. So now we're getting closer, right? I've explained terahertz. I've talked about symmetry. So how can we achieve all of this in making a faster internet? And I'd like to marry these two ideas, right? We're going to use a higher bandwidth in the terahertz, but we're also gonna introduce this two-dimensional unit cell that we'll call a metasurface. Um, in this, what we do is that you can engineer meta-atoms by um, that, the purpose of the meta-atoms is that the interaction with, the inter with the electromagnetic light is determined by the atom structure and not the material that it's made out of. Hence, if it's symmetric, it will have a certain response. If it's asymmetric, it will have another response. So let's show an example. So here we have to the left, your left, um, a perfectly symmetric four-gap metasurface unit cell. And on the right, we can introduce asymmetry by shifting this cell by 40 microns. In practice, what you have to make a metasurface is that you would repeat these unit cells just like you rep would repeat an atom in a periodic lattice. So you would have many, many, many of these unit cells. Um, the other thing that's very, very interesting and something that I really like to tell my students is that some of the same physics that you learn in, introductory in, in the introductory course sequence, specifically in this case, the LC oscillator, is the same physics that we're using now to hopefully one day modulate the signal of the internet. Um, so that can be seen in this particular graph. Um, so the red curve is for the symmetric case. And that resonance dip that you see at around 600 gigahertz is directly corresponds to the omega naught equals square root of one over LC, the inductive capacitance resonance. But in the black curve, by inducing this asymmetry, what do we see? Multiple new modes that pop up, right? And now, what, with these new modes, as a modulator, you can now 
function or work in different frequencies that may be very, very advantageous to those that are trying to create terahertz wireless networks. We can go even a step further, right? Because one of the drawbacks of, say, um, metamaterials is that this is kind of a static thing. If I want to change this or move it in frequency or in frequency or also in transmission, I'd have to make a completely new device. But nature is kind to us. And we have this thing called nanomaterials. So if I have a single um, monolayer thick of carbon atoms, what we like to call graphene, we can manipulate the material properties of graphene. And in this case, what we want to do is we want to change the conductivity. How can we change the conductivity? There are several ways that people have shown that you can change the conductivity. In this case, for the devices that you see in A and B, we're applying a voltage. And by applying that voltage, you can then change the conductivity. By changing the conductivity, then you'll see that there's modulation in the signal. This, and um, sorry, in the frequency, but also in the transmission. Other ways of changing it that my lab is looking into is um, with high magnetic fields, but also optically. So you can do all of that to actively change this device. The other aspect is that, again, if we introduce asymmetry in the, in the unit cell, then you have these multiple modes that pop up. So our holy grail device, um, the one that my graduate student will hopefully use to graduate, is that he will marry these two ideas to show a fully functional device that's also multi-mode. Thank you guys so much for your attention. Um, I'd like to first thank the many students that I've amassed um, that from actually high school students. I actually had two high school students supported by the Army in my group this summer. Um, but all of my undergraduate, my graduate students, and my postdoc that's not pictured because he just got here on Monday. Um, I'd also like to thank our collaborators at the Howard Nanoscience Facility and at the University of Dayton. Thank you all for, my, for your attention.